Okay. So I'll get started for the first part of the talk and then um, which covers obstructive sleep apnea and exactly what it is. A lot of you are familiar with it and may have been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea yourself. Um, but essentially apnea means cessation of airflow. So the airflow stops. You can see on that picture there, there's two um, purple blue uh, ribbons there. Um, the one more to the left that's going through the guy's nose, um, uh, that, that shows where the air wants to get through, but there's closure of the airway in the back of the throat and the smaller one to the right going through his mouth. Um, there, the air can't get through because of a, a upper airway issue of entering into the mouth and can't get past the tongue. And so um, that's the basic pathophysiology of it. Um, it's very common, over 20 million Americans have it, um, of at least moderate to severe. And a lot of, a lot of these cases are undiagnosed. Um, um, so that's it in a nutshell. There's um, the slide that just came up or the sub, sub portion of the slide there on the lower right. Um, you can see where apneas uh, or that airflow that when it stops, it affects your oxygen, blood oxygen level. Um, and goes down to 84% the first time and the apnea lasts 46, uh, 47 seconds. And essentially a repeat of the same event, uh, this, that time a little more, bit more severe. Um, so it has consequences to your oxygenation when you sleep at night and can cause uh, interrupted sleep so that you don't feel very refreshed in the morning. Next slide, please. And so um, why, why do we care? <laughs> Um, because it does have detrimental effects, uh, both subjective and objective. Um, subjectively, um, patients feel fatigued. Um, they can't get up and going, brain fog. Um, you know, and, and, and actually we see this in terms of more accident risk in patients with untreated sleep apnea. Um, you know, snoring with a bed partner, uh, we refer to that as spousal arousal, meaning you keep your partner up all night and then they're they're just as unrefreshed in the morning as, as the patient with the sleep apnea. Um, and then also there are some not, many objective uh, measurements of detrimental effects to untreated sleep apnea, uh, mainly affecting the heart and the brain, increased stroke risk and uh, abnormal heart rhythms um, and that can lead to worse consequences. It is a risk factor for heart attack and stroke as well. Next slide. And so um, CPAP is great when it works. Um, it's the frontline therapy, it's the gold standard. That's always what we try first. Um, if you have sleep apnea, get on a CPAP and love it, great. That's the end of the story, but that's often not the case. <laughs> and so uh, for a lot of patients, they just struggle and they try and they just can't get used to it. Um, next slide. And so um, when that's the case, there are other options. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Trott um, to continue the talk. Let's see if I pop up here. Can you guys see me? I can see uh, Dr. Malish, but I'm not sure anybody can see me. I can't see myself, of course. I can see you, you're good. All right, good, well, there you go. So uh, there are a couple of different options short of um, when CPAP is not effective, but obviously CPAP is the way to go. And in patients with moderate to severe sleep apnea, Dr. Malish is right. We do go to see for CPAP. Any of these positive airway pressure devices are usually extremely effective and the patients that can tolerate them, that's the way to go because it's not an operation. In patients with mild sleep apnea, sometimes we'll go to an oral appliance, which kind of looks like two retainers stuck together that pulls your jaw forward. And since it's pulling your jaw forward, it's also pulling your tongue forward with it. And that can be effective typically for the, the milder forms of sleep apnea. And then historically, like when I trained at Cleveland Clinic, what we always did was anatomy altering surgery. Take the tonsils out. People have tried removing parts of the tongue. Um, basically very painful procedures, which have a role in limited cases. But unfortunately, while they may be efficient, uh, effective in some mild cases, they typically don't work for moderate to severe sleep apnea. So what we've been looking for is a solution and I'd kind of gotten away from doing anything because I hated hurting people when we weren't sure if it was going to be effective or not. And I was really frustrated because we didn't have a good solution for, to offer our patients with sleep apnea who couldn't tolerate CPAP. And that's a large number of people, actually. 
Let's go to the next slide. So you guys came to hear a little bit about uh, Inspire, which is a essentially the way I like to think about it is a pacemaker for the tongue, which times tongue movement forward with inspiratory effort. So when people are trying to breathe in when they're asleep at night, and of course it's off during the day, they tend to have these obstructions, obstructions and that's why we use CPAP. And people can't tolerate CPAP. This is an alternative. It's an operative procedure where we put this pacemaker, which is shown on the left. Uh, it's a two incision approach these days, not three incisions that was initially shown. And this is off during the day. There are two incisions that we placed to put the to do the operation. I'll show you that in a minute. And if you want to go ahead, Aaron, and run this video, I'll show you how people turn this on at night. So this is a demonstration of a patient. Uh, before going to bed, you have a little controller and you just put it over the device and click it. And it works by sensing breathing. And then when there's a respiratory effort, you're trying to breathe in, it pulses and moves the tongue forward during the respiratory effort, thereby eliminating the obstruction in the back of the throat. The operation typically takes about 50 to 90 minutes, really depending on anatomy more than anything else. You can go to the next slide, Aaron, if you have one. So the, as I mentioned, this is an operation done as an outpatient procedure. I'm doing two of them on Friday. Um, it's done through two incisions, one to place the pacemaker type device on the right side of the chest typically. Um, and then also a, there's a little probe that goes between the ribs, between the second and third rib typically to sense when the respiratory muscles are moving. And then a separate wire that goes underneath the skin to about an inch and a half incision kind of parallel to the bottom of the jaw on the right side. I would say that about 80% of patients have really no discomfort to speak of other than some Tylenol that they might need. There is a small group that has pain in the, oddly in the head or the jaw that can last for a couple of weeks after the procedure, but compared to doing something like a tonsillectomy, it's really not bad. People can return to normal activity pretty quickly. Battery life typically is about 11 to 11 and a half years, and it just doesn't quit suddenly. Is actually on that little device that we were showing you how you activate it. There's a light on the back of that tells you you're coming up on uh, your battery replacement. Right now, at this point, MRI scans, which has been the kind of the limitation, can only be safely performed on the head and on the extremities. So basically, your shoulders, back, and hips are not currently permitted. I would anticipate, based on what I understand has been submitted to the FDA, it hasn't been approved yet, but we anticipate that it's going to be approved for MRIs uh, to be uh, safe by the end of next year. But again, that's totally predicated on the FDA, which is uh, looking out for all of us. Next slide. So what I'll do here, basically, kind of the way things work generally is people can either approach our office through Shauna, who you'll meet, or Dr. Malish, or they can come to me and people will have sleep studies and then hopefully have tried CPAP because that's kind of required. We want to establish that you've got moderate to severe sleep apnea. I do the surgery. Surgery is typically done on a Thursday or Friday. People are, I've not had anybody not be able to go back to work on a Monday. And then about two weeks after surgery, I see people typically by telehealth. So they don't have to come to the office just to check the incisions. And then four weeks after that, we turn the device on and test it and make sure it's working properly. Of course, we're testing it in the operating room, of course, but we want to figure out how to best set it up for you to use at home. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Shauna, who is, uh, we certainly do these activations also in our office, in my personal office, but Shauna, who works with me in the sleep lab, also activates them. And that's typically the process. Thank you, Dr. Trott. Um, so when the device is activated for the first time, I do want to point out this is typically done about a month after your insertion. Um, we allow time for it to heal so that the tissue swelling decreases and there's no confusion of any discomfort with stimulation with just general healing practices. Um, but when it's turned on in the office for the first time, we're going to really establish these initial comfort settings for you. We want you to go home with a setting that feels comfortable, that you feel that you are confidently able to sleep with that night. Um, we're looking at tongue motion during this visit as well so that we can see that Inspire is working the way that it should and your tongue is getting the movement and the protrusion that we want to see with that. 
Um, we teach you at this initial visit as well to use your remote. The patient is in a lot of control with the settings of Inspire and how they can increase or decrease the levels of stimulation based on their own comfort. You should never have to sacrifice your sleep or be in pain or any type of discomfort with Inspire. The idea is that this is something that's going to be stimulating your tongue, um, just the motor movement of the tongue, not necessarily the sensory aspect. So it's something that you should be able to comfortably sleep with, and it shouldn't interfere with your ability to maintain sleep or be waking you up in the middle of the night. Next slide, please. Oh, this is just a video that will show the initial activation. Um, if it's playing here, it'll demonstrate how we are able to connect with a programmer to your device and look at that initial tongue motion while it's stimulating. And there, if you can see that in the small video, there is a remote, it's about the size of a computer mouse um, with the pretty, pretty straightforward buttons. It's pretty user-friendly, um, not a lot of confusion there as well. I think the biggest question that we get asked is, you know, does this work? And it's really clinically proven that we see a significant reduction in sleep apnea events. Uh, if you look at the graph here before INSPIRE in this clinical trial, the average apnea hypopnea index, or you can think about that as the number of pauses in breathing per hour of sleep in the patients in the study was 29.3. And after INSPIRE, we see this reduced down to 6.2, which is a 79% reduction in sleep apnea events. Next slide, please. We also see this is something that, you know, most people ask about for their bed partner is snoring. You know, this is something that we really want to see be successful for everyone involved with INSPIRE. Um, in the study is 83% of patients prior to INSPIRE had reported significant snoring. We saw a tremendous 88% reduction in that after INSPIRE down to only 10%. So while it may not completely eliminate it, it certainly does decrease snoring um, and makes it more tolerable for the bed partner as well. Next slide. Patient satisfaction with INSPIRE is tremendously high, and this is something that's really impressive for myself. Um, managing both patients with INSPIRE and patients with CPAP, the compliance can be a really big struggle for many people with CPAP. Um, we see with INSPIRE that there's a 94% positive feedback, and that is really significantly higher than I see in my own personal experience in patients with CPAP. I would say that there's um, probably about 30% of patients out there who truly love CPAP. They they would never sleep a night without it. They joke that they, they would marry their CPAP. There's probably a solid 40% of patients that are overall satisfied with CPAP. And there's a really big 30% of the population with CPAP that no matter what we do, just they don't tolerate it. Um, you know, we can try to troubleshoot, but inevitably it's something that they're not going to wear long term and ultimately remain untreated prior to INSPIRE. And so having such a positive feedback from patients has been really great with INSPIRE, and that's reflected in average usage. Um, anyone that's been through CPAP has probably been told the story that they need to use it a minimum of four hours per night, which can be a really big struggle for a lot of people who don't tolerate it. And with INSPIRE, we're seeing that average usage is around six hours per night, which is even higher than the benchmark that's required with CPAP. So that's really great. And there's, there's no minimum requirement with INSPIRE. You know, the goal with therapy is to use it all night, every night. And so we're seeing that reflected in a much higher usage rating. Next slide. Uh, this slide just uh, really reviews some of the publications with INSPIRE. There's been over 100 peer-reviewed studies, a very large five-year STAR trial that tracked patients in the long term with INSPIRE to look at safety and efficacy. 
um, that demonstrated both. You know, this is something that works, it's something that works long term, and it's something that is safe for patients. Um, there's an adhere registry with Inspire that has um, an enrollment goal of 5,000 patients to continue to monitor. Um, and we see this reflected as well with insurance adoption. Um, we see that it's accepted by most private insurance companies as well as Medicare and even many of the VA and military insurances are covering Inspire. So, you know, it's really looking at the data, looking at the results and it, it being accepted by all of these um, medical insurance coverages that, that shows that it works. Next slide, please. And so there is some criteria that we really wanna think about if you are interested in Inspire. First, uh, we want to see that sleep apnea is to at least a moderate or severe degree that is primarily obstructive in origin. And so what that means is we wanna see pauses in your breathing anywhere between 15 and 65 times per hour. And these events do need to be caused from that obstructive sleep apnea, that collapsible upper airway that we've talked about because that's what Inspire is able to treat. We also want to see that patients have demonstrated inability to tolerate CPAP or not able to get consistent benefit from CPAP. If there is a less invasive alternative, if the gold standard CPAP works for you, there is no reason to go into an operation of any kind. It is also uh, recommended that patients have a BMI less than 35, in some insurances less than 32, but 35 is is now, from my understanding, pretty widely adopted by most, in, most insurances. There is an upper airway anatomy exam that is performed prior to implementation as well. This is a very brief procedure that's performed in the endoscopy suite by Dr. Trott, where he is looking with a camera in your airway to evaluate how it's collapsing to ensure that it does collapse in a manner that Inspire is able to treat. Additionally, the um, age criteria for INSPIRE is 22 and above at the moment. So I just wanna point out as well, if there hasn't been a re recent sleep study within the past three years, it may be required to get another sleep study prior to um, pursuing this further. That can be done simply by a home-based sleep study as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean coming in and spending a night in the sleep lab either. Next slide. InspireSleep.com is a really great resource that I would encourage anybody who is interested to explore further if you haven't already. Um, it has a great patient ambassador program that can help you connect with patients who have already had Inspire and can talk you through a little bit more about the journey. There are really good patient videos that explain the procedure and the activation and how Inspire works. Next slide. And this slide will bring up again at the end of the visit. So if you want to jot down the number there to call and schedule an appointment, if this is something that you're willing to pursue and you want to talk to either Dr. Trott, Dr. Malish, or myself more detailed about Inspire, um, the number is right there. Or you can visit our website at St. John's Health slash Inspire Sleep to get connected. Next slide. Um, here's just a slide. It really goes over some of the accolades to St. John's. Um, I'm very proud to work for this hospital. We've we won a lot of top awards um, for not only rural hospitals, but even just nationwide. We've we've really have some tremendous staff here. We have great physicians. Dr. Trout, Dr. Malish are, are wonderful to work with. Um, it's really personalized care coming to St. John's. I know that Dr. Trout gives his cell phone number to anyone who's undergoing surgery with him, which is just incredible, something you're certainly not gonna find at bigger hospital settings. And why not have a small outpatient procedure in the beautiful Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where you can recover here in the mountains. Next slide, please. The Inspire Sleep app as well. Um, there's a QR code here on the slide. If you can hover your phone over that to take a picture, 
Um, it's a really great tool. I really encourage all of my patients who have Inspire to download this app. The videos that are on the website are also loaded onto the app and are really easy to access. Again, connecting with people who already have Inspire. Um, this is a really great reference once you've had it implanted as well, so that if you have questions about the remote, um, we're going to go over that in a lot of detail at your activation, but it's always good to have something to refresh your memory at your fingertips. 